So, Kira, can you, can you hear me quite... I've got a bit of a soft voice. I hope you can hear me. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about the impact of cultural conservation and particularly uh, wet organics in New Zealand. And it's interesting that I've got Roger in here as well. Um, <coughs> Roger was always very interested in conservation and he was a wonderful mentor and, and colleague to me um, during the beginnings of, of starting up the conservation laboratory. So just to give you a bit of a timeline, um, in 1979, the Human Sciences Building opened um, at the University of Auckland and a conservation laboratory was there, but it really served um, the staff um, in the department. So when sites such as Kohiko um, at the bottom here, in the image at the bottom here, was dug, the um, artefacts came back to the lab to be conserved. And in 1986, I um, had finished my thesis and been overseas <coughs> to study and came back to the lab. And I realised that there was no one doing wet organic conservation in New Zealand and we were losing a lot of taonga. And so um, we started accepting artefacts and, or taonga from around New Zealand and we um, paid for the lab by cost recovery and mostly through um, grants from the Lottery and Environment and Heritage. In 2009, um, we ceased to get grants from LEH and um, we had moved to full cost recovery and that was largely because of the amendment in the Protected Objects Act where when, when Tonga are found, they're the property of the Crown and they have to pay for their conservation. So I currently direct um, conservation at the University of Auckland lab and at seven satellite facilities around New Zealand. I just put this example in to give you an idea of the sorts of, sort of work that we do. This is Somerset Levels in England, and it's a trackway that's being conserved. And they've been able to date it fairly accurately to about 6,000 years, 6, years ago. rather. Um, and I'm using dendrochronology um, with another colleague at the University of Auckland for, for trying to date um, Walker as well. But of course we have wetlands in New Zealand and they're scattered all over New Zealand. Um, this is a map of wetlands, not wet sites, but all of these wetlands have the, um, you know, the possibility of having a wet site in them. And of course, they're in a variety of different places and swamps and streams and there's salt and fresh water. Buxton um, from DOC believes that only about 10% of the wetlands that existed when Europeans arrived um, still remain. And that, of course, is largely because the landscape was changed to make it so-called economic and um, wetlands were drained. And the thing is, today, uh, wetlands are being reinstated, which is wonderful, but it's, it's no good for wet site archaeology because once the site has been dried out, that's it. So organic materials um, deposited in our wetlands provided a really important um, component to our past and wood and other organics were really important. About 80% of everyday assemblages were um, organic materials. But despite this, they're, they're not very well represented in, in the archaeological record, and that is, of course, because they're perishable, unless they're in a fairly stringent sort of environment. And that uh, requires it, that the environment is either anaerobic, with no oxygen, or very dry, such as in a cave. So what's facilitated a lot of conservation over the last 20 years is uh, legislative changes, and these are some of them. Probably the most important one for us is the Protected Objects Act. And it was amended, as I said, in 2006. And we wrote, a lot of people wrote uh, revisions for it. And one of the ones that um, I was involved with was that, that freshly um, recovered taonga, particularly wet organic taonga, had to be conserved or we would keep losing it. So all these um, acts state in different ways, you know, that Maori culture, that their physical and, um, physical and spiritual values must be considered prior to any work taking place. And very briefly, just to let you know, um, the impact of excavation, it's a crucial stage, not only for the site, but for the taonga that are inside it. Um, immediately, the, the taonga lose the, the matrix or the support that they've had for hundreds of years, um, and light and oxygen accelerate deterioration. And if something is very degraded, um, overnight, if something is put out overnight, in the morning it could be gone if it's very degraded. 
So what we have to do very quickly is establish a post-excavation equilibrium. And one of those um, conditions for, for the site and for the Tanga is that it must be kept wet. For Tanga, they must really be kept fully immersed in water so that there's no um, loss of moisture below full fibre saturation, which is quite difficult on sites sometimes. I just want to give you a very brief understanding of what we do to conserve the Tanga so, so that. Um, at the top there is a scanning electron microscope picture of um, beautiful sound wood and you can see the vessels and the fibres. And the slide below it is a spe the same species of wood that's degraded and been dried out. So you can see there's quite a lot of disarray. And what we do is exchange the water that has um, <coughs> deposited itself inside the artefacts with a, sub a substance called polyethylene glycol. There's many different ways of conserving but that's the one that we use mostly. And what that does is deposit itself around the cell lumen and the cell in the cell walls, and we're able then to drive the water off and the artefacts will keep shape. So that lower um, image is of a peg-loaded section of wood. Now, I don't know if this will work. Let's see. This was given to me by a German, German colleague, Hintzer, the language. I was hoping that you might be able to see how this... Oh yeah. So this is what happens when untreated degraded wood dries out. So you not only lose the surface if it's an ornately carved um, piece, you not only lose the surface but it, it opens up on the rave and um, you lose all the volumetric aspects of it as well. This is a, a worst case scenario though. <coughs> So these are the different methods. This is a chart I put together for a publication and they all have spin-offs. Some, some uh, chemicals are flammable, some are very quick but um, you need a lot of expertise and expensive equipment and some are slow and I'm afraid that um, PEG impregnation, which is what we use mostly, is very slow but it's very thorough and it's non-toxic and it's soluble in water and it's almost fully reversible. So it has a lot of attributes. Um, so yeah, I thought I'd talk to you about um, several of the different sites around um, New Zealand where we've been conserving artefacts. Just to say that, that um, no two projects are the same. Why is it doing that? Maybe I'm not holding this. <laughs> yeah, no two projects are the same. Um, and collaboration and diversity are really important. So I'm just one, one little small piece um, in, in, the, in the wheel of, of conserving artefacts. And the main one is um, collaborating with iwi. And that's the first thing that we do, go to the site and ask them what they would like to happen and go from there. So this is um, an artefact, a, little, a very small little walker that was found on an estuary. And the iwi didn't really have a place to conserve it. And so we decided that we'd conserve it as a colleague of mine had done in Germany in a gallery. It was very successful. Everyone was very interested in seeing the process because normally um, conservation is done behind closed doors. So it was just a little walker and there was two sections to it. When we put it on display and started treating it in the gallery, somebody walked in and said they had the other piece to it. And we kind of said, oh yeah. But he did, and so we were able to fit it together, and um, yeah. So that was a really good thing of, of, of conserving in public. And this is a walker that was found about four metres down um, and drilling for a new substation in the Hutt River. Very unusual, it's um, a rough out, um, so it's not complete, but <clears throat> very robust, and it has a very odd sort of way of butting up to the next section. So this, this uh, walker was conserved underneath Radio New Zealand House and it's now dry, but it's the, um, there's several claimants for it and so we're going through the Murray Lang, or I'm not going through the lamp, that's not my brief. The Ministry for Culture and Heritage will um, help assign ownership. This is a tiny little river walker from um, Mutawai, west of Auckland. Um, has a very V-shaped profile to it. 
and it has a little square step inside the hull which we think was for a mast. So they were, it looks as if they were probably sailing off the coast of Muridawai. And again, it's a fairly modern date. And the last modern one is, um, this walker was found in the Waikato River Delta, and it's made of kauri. And um, we've tried to use dendrochronology on, on this walker, but we didn't get enough rings, really. <coughs> we think from the C14 date and marrying up with what data we do have in, with dendro, that it's around about 250 years old. So pre-colonial, but not, not, not early. And it's about seven metres long. Interestingly, most of the walker that I can serve is seven metres long. It must be something to do with that's where they break off. Um, it has very fine, finely carved um, walls. And that's probably because it was used on the Waikato and it needed to be easily driven. But also there's a portage nearby and it would have, it would, the lighter it was, the easier it would have been to get it into the Manukau Harbour. So one of the beauties of this project is that the um, Kaumatua is a carver and I was able to um, print out a 3D image of this walker and he's now going to uh, replicate that with a carving on the portage site, so um, in the township of Waiuku. So a little bit further away in Papanui Inlet, this is um, a site that many people here will know and it has been investigated for many years. Um, it's a site that's eroding into the sea um, and, and frequently yields artefacts um, and, or Tonga. Uh, when we first went to the site, it was a very um, unassuming little bit of um, piece of wood, but we could see that there was a real curve on it and um, started excavating. And I had a builder in the background that um, I said, make, make the tank two metres long and I'll phone you if, if anything happens. And so I think we got up to 6.3 metres. Yeah. But he was very understanding and kept um, altering his tank. A really unusual walker, this. It, it's um, a dugout, but it has down both sides of it a, a ledge that would, would have been used for longitudinal stiffening. And um, also that would have allowed some hull thickness you know, to, to hollow it out a little bit. Initially, we thought the ledge was just down one side, but then when we laser scanned it, we could see that there's a flare on the other side and, the, and it's on both sides. But one of the beauties of this site was that there was woven fibre work, you know, archaeologist's dream, really, inside the walker and underneath the walker. And um, it's made of cabbage tree, and it's 463. So that means that the last use of the walker was around um, 460 years ago. And one of the other beauties at Papua Nui was that um, an outrigger was found not very far from the site, which means that they were, of course, that they were sailing. I'm, oh yeah, I meant to say that uh, with outriggers, there's only about five outriggers known in New Zealand um, in Aotearoa museums. So really important to have this, probably because they just perished, you know, they fell aside and, and perished. And we've written a paper um, about the Papua Nui Waka. And an important part of that was um, Iwi members writing with me and writing the, uh, you know, of their perspectives of, of, the taong, of the waka and associated taonga. So very recently, another waka strait was found in the Wairarapa. And um, it's difficult, you know, with dating, dating wood, all you do is date the tree. So having those other cultural... Um, artifacts is really important. For this one, we dated the tree, which was 961. We just wanted to make sure that it was pre-contact. And um, then there was some cement, um, um, peat, cemented onto the surface of it. And that's come back about 560 BP, which is in keeping with the way it looks. It looks like the other old canoes that we have um, through conservation and I'll talk to you about those just in a second. So it looks quite similar to Anna Wacker and Doughboy. And finally, um, the Anna Wacker canoe. So this was found on the northwest tip of the South Island um, by itself with no archaeology. Um, it's a very big, robust piece of waka, just over six metres long. It has lashing holes around its whole perimeter and four ribs and a long stringer. 
And the date um, we think is early 1400. I think actually it could be earlier than 1400, slightly earlier than 1400. We dated the corking that we found in the lashing holes and because that was replaced frequently, that gave us a fairly accurate date. And also, um, with the Anaweka Waka, the, the long stringer has been reused, so it had lashing holes in it, but they clearly broke off, see, in the centre there, and so then they started digging into the hull, so it has some antiquity of use. And the other thing that everybody loves about Anaweka is that on the, side of, of, on the outside of, the stra of this strake was um, a turtle motif. And, of course... Um, Turtle designs are rare in New Zealand carvings, and we think it probably relates to its ancestral Polynesian origins. I put this in because it was such an interesting day. We were working with iwi, and we couldn't get a signal to um, laser scan it because Waterlog Ward, unfortunately, is black and shiny. So um, we were there and kind of desperate to get the work done, and I drive into town to the museum and got a ream of um, acid-free tissue, and here we are, Jeff Irwin and a member of the Iwi and I are pasting the tissue onto the walker so that we could get some signals. And it worked really well, but um, the next day we heard that the, the Iwi member went into town and said to his friend, as people are really weird, they were sticking cigarette papers on that walker all afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> Such a lovely... And so we've written um, an article about this walker in PNAS, and I'm very happy to send it to anyone that's interested in getting a copy. And we've also written an article about um, different waka that have been conserved over the last 10 years. And um, that's available through um, the Journal of Pacific Archaeology if anyone wants it. So just very briefly, we have many dates and several different types of waka. I need to add to this one two other waka that, are, that have um, been discovered since we made this chart up. Um, but we have a very small sample at the moment, but, but there is an emergent timeline um, appearing. Um, and I think you know, as time goes on, if the expertise and the, the funds are available to conserve Waka, we'll, we'll be able to get a really good picture down the line. And it, it's become really obvious that the first humans to Aotearoa adapted quickly to their environment using endemic timbers and modifying their technology. So going from planked walker to dugout walker, um, from multi-hulls to single wall hulls, from, from sailing to paddling, those, those sorts of things. I mean, it's all very um, general at the moment. Those are, those are the general um, direction. That's the general direction that we're moving in. And we think that the outcomes from conservation of waterlogged canoes has ongoing research implications um, for researchers. Frequently in conservation, people put before and after photographs, and I'm not quite sure why they do it. I think it's to sort of demonstrate their skill, but I thought that I would do this, a before and after photograph. <laughs> <laughs> and it's the result really of three decades of pleading for money to conserve these taonga. Um, and the result of it has been that, that, that wetlands are recognized now as significant portals to the past. The wrong way around. Uh. <laughs> and um, that reviews and legislation have really helped us conserve at-risk at taonga. We just have to make sure that they stay in place. And that, co that conservation expertise has enabled around 700 years of walker change to be documented. So I've got a couple of tasks to complete, and that is to publish decades of conservation knowledge for future researchers and to identify and mentor an iwi-affiliated cultural conservation expert. Because for about 10 years, I've been saying we need someone to come up behind me, and I think that it should be someone that has an iwi affiliation. Thank you for listening. Any questions? Ah, thank you very much, Dillis. That's been fantastic. The only one that brings on time. Uh, any questions? Oh, one question up the front.
Uh, uh, kia ora, Dillis. Um, I, I'm always interested in dendrochronology, especially um, in the New Zealand environment, which is mm. back in my day. Which we won't have a before now, thank you. But uh, it was, uh, could you talk to the audience and just explain it and what we can do in New Zealand with dendrochronology? Possible. Well, yeah. I think dendro, dendro is still in its infancy for artefacts in, in New Zealand. But what we've done is um, taken samples from the Mirawai Waka and from the Waikato Delta Waka, which are both cowry, because cowry is one of the best species to, um, it's kind of king in dendrochronology. But in both instances, we didn't have enough rings. So um, Gretel and I are still working on ways of, um, yeah. Oh, right. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah, dendrochronology is tree ring dating. So what they do is um, count the rings and it, can, it, gives you the age, it gives you the age of the artifact or the tree or... Yeah. Sorry. Um, before we go to for a cup of tea, just a comment made by... Uh, our matua over here, Tohunga Reliata Moanatu um, Kiteripo. He made some uh, observations about our swamplands, about our wetlands disappearing because they are the sources. We kill those, we kill the river. And so, thank you again, Dennis. It's been fantastic having you with us and what a great presentation.